Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey man. What's going on? How are you? We got Nadim and Kevin again. That's right. On Go Figure Podcast. Today we're gonna talk a little bit about some things that that matter very much personally to us Mm -hmm. in terms of the philosophy of building a long-term, sustainable, successful business, Mm -hmm. right? That's right. And I think that's that's the theme that we wanted to talk today. Uh, For those of listeners that don't know, we're the co-founders of Gojek. And um, I think a lot, just to kick this off, I think a lot of people talk about short-term success criteria for technology companies? Well, I think it's, uh, people don't even see it as, as, as short term, right? It's, mm. it's people usually, people or media uh, usually highlight the things that um, short term strategies often are closely linked to. Um, so it's very easy to kind of look at Oh, look at these valuation numbers. Look at the money raised. Uh, look at you know revenue or users or, mm. or, or all these numbers, uh, which are important. But um, when you just kind of see a, that that is the that is the ultimate objective, the be all and all, um, it becomes easy then you know when you're building a company uh, to just optimize for those things. And w- what are the things that get you those things immediately? Uh, rather than thinking about, you know, building an enduring uh, company or an enduring business, okay. and and most of those things that we talk about or the media talks about mm. are usually related to growth or capital raising mm. or uh, you know how many people you've hired, um, yeah. and, and all of these kind of. Uh, in some ways, they are kind of the equivalent of lagging indicators as opposed mm. to leading indicators mm. of success, right? Mm. If you mm. just focus mm. on mm. output numbers, then mm. at a certain point, those output numbers like revenue, sustainability, all this other stuff might go down over time if mm. you're not investing mm. in the long-term leading indicators um, of health in an organization. Mm-hmm. And would you agree with me that most of those revolve around how the internal organization operates? Yeah, it's 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 the how, right? Uh, I think uh, it's easy to think that you're doing things the right way um, uh, when the what is you know all you care about, right? And and the what that you know is easily validated are those you know those numbers, uh, those uh, uh, those media stories are easy to kind of um, it's easy to see that oh that's kind of the uh, the the objective, and so you know when you go back. Uh, but when you actually go back and, 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 and think about like, you know, how are you achieving those? Um, oftentimes, you know, you realize that, you know, you, these things are, 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 are exactly as you mentioned, are actually, I guess you can say lagging indicators because if you're not doing things the right way, eventually those things all kind of you know, fall apart. And I think what oftentimes isn't really being discussed, uh, uh, at, at least at the same kind of pace or at the same kind of breadth or depth is really the how. Mm. Right? I think people, uh, media, rarely talk about the how, they just talk about the what. And, and all these hows, and we're going to mention, uh, I think we're going to go deep into three things, mm. which are some of our strategic themes for, for this year, 2019, is really about the how. Mm. And what's really interesting about it is that all these hows do have no short-term payoff. They're very hard mm. at realizing value up early. That's true. But it requires a huge amount of faith that it will pay off. But the reason why we believe in them is because for the parts of the units of the organization that we did apply these principles, mm. 
after about a year or even more than a year, then we see unreplicable payoff, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Payoff mm-hmm. that just mm-hmm. kind of like took off. Mm-hmm. And so I think for the listeners here, this is about, you know, especially for people who are starting out um, their own companies or, or starting a tech division within their company, etc. Or even people who are, you know, already are just kind of like working at a company that is that is scaling right now. That's right. Even even current employees mm-hmm. of, of tech companies, etc. Mm-hmm. Thinking about these long term organizational investments, they're just like savings. The earlier that you invest mm. in these, the more powerfully they will manifest uh, in the company's future. Wait, they compound. They right? compound. Yeah, exactly. Just like saving a dollar every mm-hmm. day, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so let's talk about these these mm-hmm. three things. So in 2019, there's three specific strategic themes that Gojek has that represent our long-term investments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the first one. Uh, organizational investments mm-hmm. and the first one is this uh, the theme is called be the best at what matters mm-hmm. what truly matters and this is a theme around focus yep. and yep. around prioritization the second uh, uh, theme is uh, really about bottom-up innovation mm-hmm. and how to institutionalize that mm-hmm. within the organization mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. opposed to top-down mm-hmm. method and the third theme is uh, really about building bridges mm-hmm. and breaking walls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So just to review uh, uh, that one more time, it's about being the best at what truly matters, which is about uh, a, a focus. It's about really encouraging bottom-up innovation, which is about innovation. Mm-hmm. And the third theme is about building bridges and breaking walls within the organization, which is about alignment Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and communication. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, So those are kind of a triangle of long-term competitive advantage and long-term performance that we want to institutionalize in in Gojek Mm -hmm. in 2019 Mm -hmm. even more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And I think these are the things that very often organizations are too lazy to invest in upfront because they don't give there's no instant gratifications here that's right yeah there there rarely there rarely is for any kind of you know organizational investments um, and I, I actually think that um, it's not just realizing it late and it's not just that I think it, it doesn't happen frequently enough I think um, there's almost a cost to it actually um, and yeah. I think that, that that's why it, it that, that's why it's not just a oh like that stuff isn't important and you know let's let's focus on you know other things um, let's let's ignore all of these that's just noise like it, it, it's not it's not just an ignorance of uh, of it it's also because they are inherently hard decisions and and um, it'll never these things will never seem kind of urgent to mm-hmm. implement like nothing is ever on fire and then you oh you have to do these things now yeah um, and so. I think uh, they are inherently kind of, uh, I guess, those so-called leaps of faith uh, because yeah, it, it's so easy to, to kind of just brush them aside. It's so easy to say, you know what, it's not worth it. Right. Um, because you... It's so fuzzy sometimes. It's so yeah. complicated. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the ultimate sacrifice of these? Should we go one by sure. one yeah, yeah, yeah. and talk yeah. about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, I think... I think one very easy one, and I think one one thing that you know we've seen here and we've seen uh, here in Gojek, uh, but also here uh, in the region and actually you know all around the world uh, is actually you know the whole bottom up versus top down thing. Right. I think that one, especially you know coming from uh, and anyone you know listening who is coming from a leadership position, I think it's very very easy um, without malice to kind of um, think that you know top down either explicitly or implicitly is, 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 is better. Yeah, and I think that even in the beginning stages mm-hmm. of our organization, we were very top-down, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, very exceedingly top-down, and, and there were some clear benefits to that. Yeah. There yeah. were some clear benefits. So we move faster, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was less of uncertainty in terms of what people should be uh, doing mm-hmm. right uh, because they receive direct commands mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, on 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 what to achieve and and sometimes how to achieve it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was less uh, 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 lack of clarity in what product 
teams need to prioritize because their leaders just prioritize for it or we mm -hmm. prioritize mm -hmm. uh, for them. So there were all of these perceived benefits, mm -hmm. right, that you could immediately see right away and that's how we grew yep. really fast, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so when, when, did that, when did that change and why did we decide to shift to even be more radically bottom up in the organization? So I think I think in the early stages it's um, in the early stages it's it's really easy to do uh, top down without feeling bad about it especially because you know when 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 the then the company is like thirty people all in like the same room even top down doesn't feel very top down right because it's like okay like clearly you know I'm. I am responsible for something. You're helping with this. You're responsible for that, and so it's very easy to kind of you know create that alignment, and people are excited, mm. uh, and we're all kind of just executing, right? So it's more so the the, the top down side almost feels more like coordination rather than like command and control, yeah. right? Uh, you don't have to be an asshole. Yeah, you don't to to have a top down uh, way of working. No, you a lot don't. of people confuse no. that. Top down isn't about being a uh, you know like a tyrant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, they're very very many good benevolent dictators yes. in tech companies out there right? all companies all companies, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all companies yeah and and i but i think when it really changed at least for for, for me is when um the reality is i think i think as a company you know we simply grew too fast um and it's it's out of our control right i mean we we i mean the last what four years uh we just kind of held on right, right. and it, it was it wasn't like oh we have to grow this fast we just did yeah. um, and I think when you kind of when we grew so quickly and all these people came on and like we had to have more organizational structure and more layers I think the habit of just like hey like let's do this um, uh, uh, became it morphed into top-down because in order to uh, in, in, in a top-down into I would say a negative way because you know, in order to be able to influence with 100% certainty, like hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people, you have to be extremely forceful, right? You have to almost not listen to, 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 to input right. uh, if you wanted to kind of behave in the same fast execution, quick alignment mode, right? Um, and it's easy when there's like three people in a room trying to decide something, but then when you're like, oh, okay, I need to talk to three people in the room, who have literally hundreds of people by extension reporting into them, mm. wanting that very kind of like super quick decision making after one discussion and wanting something to actually kind of happen out of that discussion immediately per that discussion, I think results in, you know, if you want that pace to happen, results in just saying, telling people at some point, just do it, mm. right? And I think what ended up happening was a lot of people ended up becoming more less engaged. Uh, you know, we, we, and why is that a bad thing? We always talk about how that's a bad thing, but what, what is a more scientific way of explaining the effects of lack of motivation or lack of sense of ownership? What does that mean in terms of real business performance? Well, I think a few things, right? I think, um, I think what we've seen, uh, what we've seen are, there's a different flavors of it. I think one is um, people then, um, don't think they don't think because like oh my boss told me to do it right and this whether or not this is a bad decision whether or not I have information that actually might uh, make this a better decision is irrelevant right I don't have to think because as long as I said my boss did it I'm safe right right so because my performance is judged based on how well I execute what my boss told me to do that's right yeah that's as right. opposed to solving the problem correct right so so then uh, people become less engaged because they're just they're just there to do to, to follow uh, to follow orders, and what's bad about that is then uh, information uh, uh, that is necessary for for better decision making doesn't happen because people's incentive is not for better decision making, right? People's mm -hmm. incentive is to oh okay, my boss told me to do that. How well and how quickly can I do it? That's right. it, right? Do you think there's a correlation to? you know, the level of quality of talent and how demotivated they get with top-down management. Like, usually the what I've realized is that the more talented a person is, their level of disillusionment when they hit that kind of top-down mindset without actually being able to air or voice their opinion effectively enough and guide the direction of whatever scope they're doing is even more cataclysmic for, for great talent. 
Yeah, I think so. And look, hey, you're a new father, right? You're a new father, and you know you have uh, you have two daughters. Um, how you know how do you how would you approach like your kind of parenting style with respect to with respect to this, right? Like, I mean, growing up, I think we all were and 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 uh, kids who probably question authority, hmm. right? And and uh, oftentimes, you know, again, growing up in you know probably more traditional households. Questioning authority was not, you know, something that was viewed positively. And but then, how did you feel in terms of, you know, the things that you did uh, uh, with respect to that authority? Right? It was. It was. You, know, you never really kind of. You felt oftentimes like you weren't listened to, right? Like yeah. that, and that. Oh, you had all these ideas, uh, but then it just didn't it it, it, it it didn't matter right, right. And, and, and you would imagine probably if you had less ideas that probably you'd be happier right I experienced that not only throughout my childhood and I, I, I got into trouble in, in high school a few times by by having being too argumentative hmm. on my, some of my ideas hmm. to my teachers but I I feel like in in the beginning stages of my professional life I, I was also so many ideas came to my mind that everyone just kind of dismissed mm. because I had no track record or anything like mm. that and mm. I was just labeled a dreamer all the mm. time right and, mm. but if you know I think you're right that's that's exactly the, the you know the, the concept of not being able to have agency or control over your thing when you know that you are capable that's mm. the difference right mm. there's mm. people who are not confident enough in their capabilities mm. and yeah sure they would like to be told what to do. Right. That makes them feel more safe. But the kind of talent that we have in Gojek, as we recruited better and better people, we quickly hit the wall with that. Very quickly. Mm. We realized that these people, why did we hire them in the first place if we're just going to tell them what to do? Right. And how did you right? feel, right? Like when you were at these places where you work and you just weren't listened to, right? I mean, you, you left. I just got it done. Yeah. yeah. And then I left after yeah. a while, right? Mm. Yeah, it was fun. It was good. I learned bunch of stuff but then mm. I'm just th I'm thinking what's next mm. I'm thinking what's next and it doesn't have to be me who's like more on the end of the entrepreneurial scale it can be anyone who just wants to have a sense of contribution yeah and and feeling that loss of control mm -hmm. uh, by just having things happen to them instead of them driving the change that they want to see in their work mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is a fundamentally different experience of working because then you're you're really owning it right and right. You're, be you're there Right. But, but did you also know people who were totally fine with just like, okay, heads down, I'm just gonna do, you know, I'm gonna do whatever, you know, whatever some someone told me, and and I think you know you, you also have smart people who kind of or smart people who also fall in that category, and I think, in a, in a way, I think we're almost we've we have a bias towards finding smart, creative, driven people, right. uh, but then at the time our structure was not appropriate for you know those types of but but people. that's but that's the difference right the, a bottom up innovation approach actually favors people potential to become leaders mm. as opposed to people's just potential as an individual contributor mm. right because the, the whole point about having a sustainable long term business is having a critical mass of people who can lead and who can drive things forward in, at, and at all leadership levels, whether it's team leader, product leader, department leader, you name it. Mm. Like you, you need these self-driven individuals who are proactively finding the solution as opposed to simply executing it. And the reason why is because the, as the company grows, the level of complexity is so high, the level of interdependency is so high, is that you have to be a creative problem solver in order to be an effective leader. And you also have to be a very effective collaborator to do that. I would agree with you, except for the uh, the individual contributor part. Right? I think I think not everyone necessarily has to be a leader of like large groups or large teams. You can still be uh, somebody who's driving, you know, something, uh, executing an idea as an individual contributor that you know is also given a lot of leeway to, to kind of you know uh, uh, have ambitious goals. Um, I, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you, but I, I do think that uh, for me, I apply this to everyone, not just people who are leading people. I also think, you know, if you're an engineer, a single individual contributor engineer uh, trying to crack, you know, a very hard problem, 
uh, when you know somebody gives you, hey, this is the strategy for our group. This is a strategy for our team. Um, being given that freedom to, even as an individual contributor, to kind of figure it out and, and actually deliver something great, I think is, is, is definitely uh, the kind of people that you know, we try and have more and more of and with the kind of people that we want to appreciate toward, uh, because of, through this policy. I, I, yeah, I get it. You can, you can either be a people leader, mm. but you can also be a thought leader. That's right. Mm. But at the end mm. of the day, you have to be a leader somehow, mm. 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 right? Mm. Even if you're not leading a team, mm. you need to have thought leadership. Mm. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference mm. between thought leadership and just being really good at execution? Thought leadership means actually thinking on your own two feet mm -hmm. and being able to come up with solutions that are better than whatever your boss told you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That should be like a fundamental kind of mechanism that happens. The more that people below you come up with better ideas, mm -hmm. the more you know you're on the right path. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not how quickly they get it done, yeah. which used to be our yeah. criteria yep. back yep. in the day. Yep. I think also a lot of, uh, one of the reasons why this is one is challenging is because a lot of times people, people leaders, uh, uh, then might feel insecure, mm. right? It's like, okay, if I am the leader here, I am the most senior person within this group of other people, and I am not the one who's coming up with the ideas, and I am not the one that's getting credit for making the right calls or, 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 or coming up with the right ideas, then what is my value, mm. right? I think I think uh, I think there's also oftentimes that question from from a, a lot of folks who then you know are, are might be resistant towards uh, towards this idea. It inherently kind of challenges um, maybe you know traditional notions of what somebody uh, in a leadership position should be doing. Yeah, it's 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 very hard. That's something that people consistently come up against like why am I here leading all these people if they can do a better job than me mm, right mm. but you are managing those people who are better than you so mm. your value you should be secure in the value that you are actually laying the groundwork for those people to succeed by so, doing mm. things that are better than you so what do you think then is the in in this framework right like what do you think is then the ideal leader like what 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 what, what should they do and and what would you give them credit for in, with, in the context of being a, a bottom-up mm. uh, facilitating leader, mm, mm, right? Mm. Well, it's hard. It, it, it also depends on what department, what function, mm. what rate of urgency there is. So there's all these factors. Mm. But overall, as a general characteristic, some of the things that even I struggle with, by the way, so mm. I'm not saying mm. I, I'm, I'm mm. very good at this as well. First is actually coming up with problems instead of solutions. Mm. That's a really simple mm. but very difficult thing to mm. achieve. Mm. Creating a verbal communication ritual mm. of sharing a problem mm. and resisting sharing the solution mm. until all parties have spoken in your mm. team. Mm. Right? Mm. It's a very small it's very small mm. nuance but yet mm. critical. Like instead of going up, "Oh, Kevin, we've got this major issue with allocation and this mm one city, I need mm. you to immediately pump up incentives right mm. now by this percent so mm. that we can hit a BCR of this mm. percent or mm. like hit a reliability rate mm. of X percent. Mm. Instead going, look, I've noticed that we have an acute allocation supply mm. problem or we have an acute supply problem mm. in this specific geography. Mm. Can you please take a look at it mm. and come up with some solutions on what you think we should do here, mm. right? Mm. So that very act of just delaying, you might have solutions in your head and that's mm. fine. Mm. You can then bring your solution, once their solutions have come up, you mm. can then bring your solutions to the table and then that's a free mm. and open transparent marketplace mm. of ideas. Mm. But mm. if you anchor your solution first, mm. then they're constantly going to be having to beat your solution mm. and, and have the confidence and they have to have the confidence to actually try to beat your solution, which mm. is a huge mental hurdle given mm. that you're their boss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When they actually did have a solution, but they're like, if I say this now, you know, mm. am I going to make him feel like his solution isn't the best? Yeah. Yep. Mm. Right? So I think that would be my one, th that's the ritual of, of share the mm. problem, ask them for a solution, and then throw, even if you do have an opinion on the solution, throw it after mm. those issues have been. That's, I think, the first thing. Mm. I think the second thing is making sure that you talk, those leaders talk to their subordinates during the planning and OKR setting. 
OKR, objectives, key results. Mm -hmm. It's basically another word for target setting mm -hmm. uh, and, and goal setting. Um, that process, not involving your one downs in that process, is basically the first, it's like the original sin. Okay. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. hard to recover mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you just set from top down that, that direction without actually um, taking in the feedback and inputs of each of those key leads under you, I think that's where the beginning of, of the end. <laughs> Mm. You know, like that's that's mm. where you start losing credibility, you start losing trust, and you start losing motivation. So I think in the planning process, what's your idea of an ideal bottom-up leader? Mm. I think f for me, uh, I agree with uh, everything that you said, um, uh, and on, on top of that, I, I think that. The ideal bottom-up leader should be providing the platform for their direct reports or for the people that work under them to shine. Mm. Um, for me, I always find it uh, non-ideal when I work with somebody who I know has you know, several direct reports. And if I work closely with them, um, if I never kind of, you know, if I never really hear uh, either directly from or at least uh, a mention of you know somebody else's um, really significant con contribution to the team uh, that's a flag mm. for me um, because to me that implies that either you know, a uh, the team uh, that the, the team's ideas are being suppressed uh, it could also mean that as a as a leader, they want to take all the all the credit uh, uh, for themselves, um, and that inherently blocks bottom up because it means that the people under this person can't rise up because then they never get the credit that they, that they deserve. That's super interesting. I have I have the inverse of that as the red flag. Mm. So when I go and say, "Hey, mm. can you do this?" Mm. and Imme the, the leader immediately says, yeah, 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 we can do that. Mm. So mm. what I've realized mm. is that the best bottom-up leaders mm. will never do that. Right. The best mm. bottom-up leaders will be like, hold on, let me talk to my team first. Yep. Right? Yep. Just that, that little tell. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a mm. really good reflection of a, of a, that's a bottom-up leader. No, I agree. Over there. Yeah. Yeah. They will first check. Mm. Or, or let me consult this person first. Mm. Or oh, that has something to do there, I'm gonna check it out first. I, so it's, it's funny, it's almost the same thing, it's just the, mm. a different way of seeing that red flag. Yeah, yeah, well, when, for you, it's when you know, you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to raise something, right? For me, it's when they're trying to raise something to me, mm. right? When they're trying to raise something to me, I would like to hear, you know, I would like to hear um, credit given uh, 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 to others. Um, and I think uh, the good sign of a, of a bottom-up leader is one that is, secure in knowing that their job is to provide the platform and distill from their team you know the best ideas mm. um, and uh, rather than being the guy or the girl uh, who has you know who has all the ideas um, and I, I think this is why it's a challenge though because oftentimes I find that the incentive to do that isn't always there um, because if I'm trying to impress somebody, and again, to, to, this is, I, I think, actually quite thematic to this discussion, uh, which is that if I'm trying to impress somebody, the shortest path towards that is to show them that I came up with these ideas and I did all of that, right? right? And uh, um, so if you kind of focus too much on the what and the output here, which is just like, oh, me, uh, then the easiest thing to do is just for, it's for me to always make it look like you know, I'm the person who has all the ideas and the execution to my boss. And I think for, for most bosses, it's easy to fall into that trap as well, mm. right? Like if you have somebody who reports to you who's always doing well, who comes up with great ideas all the time, the natural inclination is like for you to say, oh, this person's great, right? right? Um, so that's why the, in, the challenge, I think, is also kind of getting the incentives right. Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of something that even today, I think us as an organization is, 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 is still uh, we're still grappling with. Yeah, I can't, I can't tell you how many times um, maybe I've 
I've given some positive feedback mm. like oh man this guy has just been crushing it yeah right? mm. um, this person's been crushing it um, got everything done on time mm. and really over uh, overachieved on, mm. on the mm. targets um, and was constantly being a yes man throughout that whole process mm. 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 almost like the majority of the time when I go and accidentally stumble mm. in one of their teammates mm. somewhere else over lunch yep. or yep. coffee or something like that and I ask, hey, how are you doing? And that's when the, the waterfall oh, yeah. comes out. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's yeah. been horrible. Yeah. I don't know exactly why I'm doing all this stuff. I, yeah. haven't, I haven't gone home since like two <laughs> days. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, it yeah. just it, it just shows that there there are some of these like you know achiever uh, achiever showers or mm. uh, you know uh, leaders that yes they do they hit those milestones, but at what cost? Yep. Right. Oh, and to the point of what's sustainable, right? Exactly, mm. and that's that's and that's what doesn't create that long-term success factor because then some of the best people under that person will just go, mm -hmm. they will just leave, or they will burn out, or they mm. become demotivated. But then, where is the trade-off with speed, Kev? I mean, it's all nice and easy to say this, but when you need to execute at light speed, when you need to, like we said before, run during this marathon, you mm. have to sprint during this marathon. Uh, where do you draw the balance of this bottom-up innovation? Mm. Is, is the sacrifice really? I think a lot of people are, or a lot of listeners are wondering, like, is it really worth it? Is it really like, what, what do you get? Okay, because we know the risks. Mm. You slow down. Mm. There might be some misalignment in mm. what teams are doing mm. versus each other. Mm. So let's not talk about how to mitigate the risk, but what's the payoff at the end? Mm. Let's talk about that because if the payoff is not worth it, then why are we even doing? This? Yeah, I think so. A, f a few things that I've, I've seen uh, uh, payoff wise, I've seen uh, I've seen some teams uh, or in individuals um, who have an extremely high sense of ownership. Where um, if something goes wrong, they are the first person or the first team to uh, kind of jump on uh, to jump on the problem. Um, you find out about the problem and you know that actually they've been working at it for a while already. Uh, you find out, you know, people who, you know, are putting in longer hours and not to say that, you know, we should promote necessarily longer hours, but uh, people who without being asked uh, uh, are putting in uh, uh, the additional hours. And I think the ownership comes because it's your idea. Right. Right. It's uh, your baby. Yeah. It's, it's your idea. You thought about this whole thing. Uh, you pitch this whole thing, um, you convince somebody that this is the right path, um, and now you're doing it, right? So, so for you know, if you kind of went through that whole thing, um, you know that this is this is your idea, this is your baby, and and that uh, when things don't when things don't go wrong, uh, sorry, when things don't go right or when things go wrong. You don't blame other people, hmm. right? Uh, you don't say, "Oh, that's not my problem." Um, you say, "Yeah, that's you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna solve it," and and because you also understand the decision making um, that goes into into that, um, you are also much better at problem solving it, right? Because you understand the whole logic of like why you made these decisions. You understand what the objective was. You understand the key results that you were trying to uh, achieve, and so. You know, the ownership is, is, is also, it, it's, it's, it's not just about kind of like being, you know, the first on the ground if, if, if you know, there are issues, but it, it, it's also about having the best ideas on the solutions because exactly. this is your thing. And that ownership, everyone just keeps talking about ownership like it's the greatest thing alive, but what, what about ownership makes sustainably successful teams? And I think it is the link between ownership and your teams agility and resilience to unknown problems mm -hmm. unknown problems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. once because most problems mm -hmm. are unknown problems right. you only yep. you only figure yep. that out later right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. think you can plan for all scenarios mm -hmm. and then something out of the blue comes from left field mm -hmm. and when that happens the amount of cognitive load to this the 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 higher leader mm -hmm. has to put to solve maybe put that fire out or to address that issue is so high when the entire context and level of ownership of that team is mm -hmm. not achieved. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's when the shit hits the fan yep. that actually this concept of ownership and bottom-up innovation shines. Right. And in a company that's rapidly growing, shit is always hitting the fan. Yes. I mean, on a daily ba- basis, shit yes. is hitting the fan. And that's um, the hard way. Yeah. And, and I, I think ultimately there's only three ways you can really kind of motivate a, a team to truly go above and beyond. Uh, one is obviously the, 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 that ownership. Um, the other is fear. Mm-hmm. Um, and the third is um, some material incentive, right? And, and obviously, you know, fear, fear is Fear not, and money. Fear and money. They're great for short term. Oh, they're great. They're yeah. fantastic for short term. Yeah. Disastrous yeah. for long term. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, again, you keep on going back to this theme of that this is better for longer term because, you know, how else are you going to keep people motivated in, a, in an environment that's changing so rapidly when unexpected things happen all the time? Um, if not through kind of that high level of ownership. And so let's talk a little bit about, I want to talk a little bit about what we actually did, right, Mm. in the organization to pay tribute to this bottom-up innovation. Mm. I think one of the biggest things that we did in 2019 was, in in 2018 we had like, I don't know, something like 25 key results for the company that we wanted the whole company to achieve. Mm -hmm. And what we did in 2019 is that we reduced it to seven. Mm. basically mm. Mm. and instead of creating very very prescriptive mm. uh, key results we just combined those seven metrics mm-hmm. with some strategic themes mm-hmm. three of which we're discussing mm. today in this podcast mm. but that enabled this OKR setting process to be much more bottom-up I'm not mm. saying perfectly bottom-up mm. but mm. that's what allowed people to choose how they're going to contribute to a much more limited set of metrics mm. and gave them the freedom at every level to not have a cascaded mm. target down, yep. but they rationalize how they're going to help achieve that yep. metric, yep. as opposed to we set these very prescriptive targets and goals, and it, and then each then the, the groups take it on, and then the subgroups take it on, and then it's like a cascading process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the most fascinating discoveries that I had, is that actually cascading KPIs, some, mm. some people, we used to call it, in management mm. consultant, yeah. we used to call it yep. KPIs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And during those days in McKinsey, I believed that everything was about oh, perfect alignment. So you have to have targets at the top, and everything has to be messy. Mm-hmm. The middle layer has to contribute to the top mm-hmm. layer. The lower layer has to contribute to the middle layer. And that is actually, you run into huge amounts of problems mm-hmm. cascading targets that way. Mm-hmm. Instead of creating flexibility mm-hmm. within each of the teams to determine how they want to decide and which ones they want to decide to contribute instead of just getting cascaded like a mathematical formula. Yeah, and, and, and also they will, they will decide to do things that you might question, like they might not be directly linked to these things, uh, to these specific metrics, but at the same time uh, are important you know, to, 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 the, to those themes and um, to those teams. And uh, those can also be sources of insight as to maybe these are other things that we should consider focusing on maybe during the next quarter or mm-hmm. the next half uh, these are when like uh, these are when problems uh, that we didn't realize were problems uh, uh, suddenly surfaced right like yes. we, oh we didn't know uh, that this team that's suffering on the ground because of this problem they decide like okay we're gonna tackle this yes right and and as leadership we had no idea that this was such a big problem yeah um, and so and so for the next cycle if this is if this actually is a, a, a systemic problem across the whole company or, or across multiple different uh, 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 teams, then we can decide to uh, tackle it together as a as as a group, right? But but without that process, we wouldn't have known. Yeah, because they're closer to the problems. So yeah. they just had a, a way or a means mm. to communicate mm. through bottom up, mm. right? Then mm. we're able even leaders become gain far greater Mm -hmm. visibility Mm -hmm. and transparency into what's happening on the ground Mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. and we did this right in our in our Mm -hmm. recent kind of Mm -hmm. uh, OKR setting exercise instead of you know us as Mm -hmm. co-founders kind of just challenging targets Mm -hmm. etc what we did was we invited all the groups together Mm -hmm. so that peers Mm -hmm. could challenge and review and we had a whole section of how they can help mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the issues that they can help with for other groups, and and it be, and you instantly saw the energy in the room, mm-hmm. whereby it wasn't just leaders saying, "Oh, I like that. I don't like this. I like that." There were real people contributing 
solutions to the problems of each of the individual mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. And that kind of peer rating system, peer assistance, feedback, feedback mm -hmm. is so much more powerful and led to so many better points than what we could yeah. have probably oh, come sure. up with. For sure. Right? Yeah. And that was, the, that was the payoff in my mind. That's yeah. a short-term payoff. I just got a hint of how taking a step back and managing this process between very talented people could produce better results. Yeah. Better yeah. results. And a little part of me is a little sad, right? <laughs> this is a little sad <laughs> because, because it's like I used to deliver yeah. those mm. good mm. results. But mm. when realizing at a certain scale, when a leader realizes you just can't, mm -hmm. you cannot compete with the collective creativity of your teams. Right. You cannot compete with that brain power. And a lot of leaders can't let that go. Yeah. And, and we're also much further from the problem. Right. Um, and I think that's, this is a good segue to the other theme, yep. which is around building these bridges. Build bridges, break walls. Yeah, I, I think this was, you know, this was, this was an, an interesting one because intuitively, of course, you agree like, oh yeah, of course we should foster collaboration. Of course, uh, uh, we should uh, get uh, teams to align with each other. Um, but you know, why do you think that this was something that was especially worthwhile to call out? And I think more importantly, why did you think that this was, this is something that is actually different than just kind of just saying like, hey guys, collaborate more, right? Like what, what, what does this mean? Like what are, what, what should be, we, we be willing to sacrifice uh, uh, in order to kind of achieve this? In order to achieve Building better bridges. Building better bridges. Um, I think in many ways we have to sacrifice the concept of overly, number one, overly rewarding teams for the achievements of their own team only mm. instead of the bigger group mm. or the bigger company mm. for mm. that reason. Mm. Like moving as one. Mm. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a fine line between celebrating a team's success mm. Mm and creating competitive pressure yep. to achieve mm. things that are only great for that team yep. Yep. instead of yep. elsewhere. Yep. And the inverse part is to create an incentive or a, at least a cultural incentive to help out other mm. teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So breaking down silos, there is a payoff to it, mm -hmm. right? There mm -hmm. is a cultural payoff in an organization for helping another group out mm -hmm. or another team out, even though it doesn't directly fall under yours. Mm -hmm. But we, we took some forcing, some really, really interesting mm. policy mm. changes from processes that mm -hmm. we took forth as a result of this. We didn't just say, you know, build bridges, break walls, and then not back it up by anything. Right. We actually forced groups mm -hmm. to share their key results. Right. Like a pretty significant percentage mm -hmm. requirement mm -hmm. minimum mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. that must be shared with another group. Right? And we made the requirement that product groups must share with other product groups and then functional groups must share with other functional groups and there yep. was a minimum requirement. Yep. Not only did we do that, we also created a minimum requirement of budgetary spend mm -hmm. between product groups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, I think, very, very radical requirements that in some ways jumpstart or force or jumpstart mm -hmm. the the collaborative effort of the organization, and you saw that even in our in our core product group uh, session, where everyone was like typing questions and challenges online, it was this very dynamic stuff. You could see immediately when when you had to share targets together, mm -hmm. and you have to share budget together. Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff happens. Yeah, very very powerful yeah. stuff happens. So so you have to back it up. You can't just you can't just throw it out there. It's not a, it's not just a value, like a core value. It is an actual, you know, trade-offs that you have to make. And some of the trade-offs, you were asking me about the trade-offs, what's the risk of doing it, things like that? Well, some of the risk is you actually slow down some of the key initiatives because you realize that other teams require, you, you sacrifice a little bit of your ego in a team in exchange for helping out a partner group or a buddy. Right. elsewhere right but without that requirement to share the key results then you'll never get credit for it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a lot of companies and organizations try to tell their teams you must collaborate more collaborate but they don't create the goal-setting incentive with which to achieve that yeah I, I, I think this is true for 
Look, I think a lot of the things that we we say actually, I don't think when you when you talk about it at a at a high level, right? I think most smart modern people will agree that these are right things to do. Like, I think maybe bottom up innovation is a very specific one, but you know, if if you ask like, oh, we should foster a, a, an environment where everyone in the team contributes. Yeah. Right, like like everyone will agree that yes, absolutely, we should do that, uh, and everyone will agree that it's it, it is the right thing to have teams collaborate. Right. Uh, How many times have you heard either a consultant or someone saying, "Oh, we're breaking down silos yes. in our organization"? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like the favorite catchword. Yeah. Oh yeah, we yeah. really love innovation. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, we're all about that. Yeah, but, all the time, all but, the time. But it's how how it's how, cliche, right? how far are you willing to go exactly. to kind of make that happen? I think is is, is really kind of the the uh, the marker of of, of um, you know whether or not you know companies and individuals are are serious about this. Um, and I think that's very important to to, to codify it. I know it, it seems kind of like I don't know uh, almost administrative in a way, but. I think those details of like, oh, this is infused in the way we do performance management. This is infused in the way we do uh, goal setting. This is infused in how we run uh, meetings and cadences. Right. I think that uh, that part is, I think, um, the next step of really kind of uh, uh, instituting um, these philosophies that generally sound good. Um, and I think you know we're only kind of in that first layer. But you know, I, I really do hope that you know, as a company, that we can you know go to the next layer and the next layer, and then we'll see what that means. But uh, I think we really have to be almost obsessed with like infusing that in in, in different parts of of, of, of the company, um, uh, I guess processes, if you will. And if you connect the first theme of bottom up innovation mm. to the second theme that we just discussed mm. um, about uh, building bridges mm. and breaking walls, right? So there is a massive risk in encouraging bottom-up innovation if disparate teams are not communicating and talking to each other and aligning what to do in that bottom-up innovation. Mm -hmm. Because if you do not solve the communication and siloed approach of teams at the same time that you attack bottom-up innovation will exacerbate the silo problem. That's right. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, you, if you work on only one side of this and only the bottom-up innovation and you don't crack the communication and alignment issues and the collaboration issues, then you are potentially worse off mm -hmm. because you're creating completely self-servient goals that are bottom-up but unfortunately may not help the greater goal. Mm -hmm. of the organization. So you mm -hmm. need that forcing mechanism, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. And, and, and it, is, it, is a, it, is a, it is a tenuous balance. And I think uh, in, in some ways, right, I think, I think those two actually, you know, are, are necessary for, uh, for, for the other, right? Mm. Um, I think uh, just forcing, just saying that, hey, collaborate more without it being bottom up, I think probably makes top down worse right? right like if you just say okay everyone just has to work together and this is what it's going to look like right I, I think i think actually these two parts of of uh, or these two themes actually uh, almost go hand in hand in that sense and so the the role of leadership there and i think there, there's a point to be made about when you're talking about building bridges and breaking walls forcing that from a top down approach also is not very effective no like Leaders need to reframe their mind, and I think in large-scale organizations, think about of themselves as a facilitator role mm -hmm, within mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. and manage the process, set the ground rules, mm -hmm. here's the rules of the game, here are the parameters, yeah. here's the targets you gotta share, here's the budgets you gotta share, yeah. here are the forms by which you have to meet up, mm -hmm. and then let the magic happen there with facilitation, Yeah. right? And I think that, that was, that was, that's been a big transition point for me to actually mm. force myself to move there. Mm. And then we come to the third mm. kind of uh, strategic theme, uh, which is be the best at what matters. Oh yeah, this one's good. About focus mm -hmm. and prioritization. So mm. we've cracked that we need to 
first bottom up innovation, we need to tap into the collective creativity and power mm. of our teams. Mm -hmm. Number two, we need to ensure that they are building bridges and breaking walls so that they are communication, communicating with each other, they're collaborating with each other, they're forming self, self-generated alignment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finally, when we're talking about what exactly they're doing, mm -hmm. being the best at what matters means if you're the best at everything, you're the best at nothing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This has been a contentious kind yeah. of battle we've had in, uh, in, in different forms. In yeah. different forms yeah, yeah, about, yeah. you know, you've constantly been, and I think you've been doing it rightfully, reminding me to not spread ourselves way too thin, but really determine what truly matters and refocus and redeploy resources on that. Mm -hmm. And this can be a very powerful thing when combined with bottom-up innovation, mm -hmm. because what truly matters to the user, you want the person closest to the user or to the mm -hmm. problem mm -hmm to actually decide what truly matters, mm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think, I think there's, a, there's a big risk though here in terms of deciding what, what truly matters. So this theme is about focus. Yeah, yeah. You just can't do everything. This mm. is one thing that I think all companies, including ourselves, are consistently terrible at. Consistently, it is the hardest thing to do, to focus on what truly matters because what it does require is for you to sacrifice yeah. something. I think for especially for companies that are seeing good growth, I think it's particularly problematic uh, because. Oh yeah, um, when when things are bad, you mm. you have to. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to focus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, when when you know when 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 things are when things are good, you're growing well. You know, investors want to talk to you. Everyone, you know, media is writing about. Look at all this amazing stuff that. Uh, I can do anything. Yes, of course. It's like, oh yeah, okay, well, we got this. We got this. <laughs> Um, and and I and I think um, I think it's easy to kind of uh, get into that uh, uh, into that mode and um, yeah I, I and yeah the sacrifices I think are, are are what's hard right I think in a in a world where um, you know company is growing in a world where um, there is competitive pressure uh, obviously uh, in in many different you know uh, from many different angles in the business I think. There is the temptation to say, "Oh, we have to win every single thing," right? right? I think, I think, I think that's 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 dangerous, right? And that, that's dangerous because um, it it doesn't allow it doesn't allow for that focus that that can then really build something that's sustainably advantageous or sustainably great uh, because. You know when you're juggling, and, and I think we're all guilty of this uh, uh, in, in in many many ways around thinking that hey we can do it all as a company as as, as leadership. Like I know that right now, for example, I think me personally, um, you know, I have probably I don't know like ten to f twelve like pretty major things that I am either directly or indirectly responsible for like in, 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 a, in, a, in a pretty intensive way right not, a, not in a light touch way and I know that you know f out of those things like I'm probably doing like I don't know like four or five of those things pretty pretty okay uh, and the others are probably not doing a great job and I'm probably disappointing people I'm probably dropping balls and, and I think you know really kind of taking a step back and, and thinking like how, what what are the things that really matter and, and there's a lot of different ways to define what really matters like what's urgent uh, what is high leverage um, uh, sometimes this is dangerous but you know what you're good at mm. um, uh, but I think really having that mindset of being thinking about you know what are the things that really matter and what are the things that don't matter even though I kind of feel like I should be doing them, right? Because because it, it's easy to say, oh, those things don't matter, and it's easy, right? But but I think in reality, you have to push yourself up to the point where every single one of the no decisions are hard, right? right? Uh, e easy easy things to say no to don't count. And they don't count. It's uh, got to be painful yeah. to say. And this is why I think we made all of our product uh, and, and group heads kind mm. of stand up even before they were sharing their mm. objectives and key results, right? Mm. We told them to first tell us, mm. the first part of their mm. presentation is mm. tell us what you're sacrificing. Yep. Yep. Tell us what you wanna be the best at, yep. tell us why it matters, mm. and tell us what you're gonna be sacrificing. Yeah. 
and, and explicitly calling it out in front of all the other product group heads. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah. a very powerful statement. Yeah. And then getting feedback from people about that. Mm -hmm. And some people were more courageous in this than others. Yep. Yep. But I thought that was a very powerful moment where let's not talk about what we're going to do. Yeah. Let's talk about what we're not going to yeah. do. Yeah. And that's okay. Let's have these explicit conversations. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and to your point, I thought it was really interesting. This whole notion about dis it's all fair and good until you get until you select the wrong thing yeah. to be the best at yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay? yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah. all it's all fun and games until you mm. get that decision wrong and here are some common mistakes that I've seen mm. um, and here's where it gets really tricky some of the mistakes are like people choosing uh, what they want to be the best at at what they're currently good at yeah Yep, yep. But that does not necessarily mean, like for the user, for mm -hmm. example, that mm -hmm. that's the most important thing for them. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. that they have their, their team happens to do that really well. Yeah. But in the bigger scheme of things, it's not what truly matters to their end user. Yeah, and okay. you see this in product teams all the time, right? Oh, like you know, we have this feature that you know we've been working on you know for a long time. Uh, you know, we've invested so much time and effort, and look at all these great things that this thing can do now. But right. does it? I mean, do people actually care? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I think, I mean, without naming, you know, specific things that we've done, there's definitely been a few big things that we've done. We've invested a lot of time and effort in, and I think they're actually, you know, pretty good in and of themselves. But, you know, whether or not they're really impactful, whether or not they're really worth the effort, was uh, yeah. debatable. It's debatable at the very best. Yeah, debatable. And this is where it also gets tricky. Is like. What you want to be the best at, what truly matters, must be passion agnostic. Mm, interesting. This is the hard part. Because a lot of people decide that, some people may decide what they want to be the best at is something they're deeply passionate about. Mm. Mm. Instead of what their end user is deeply passionate about. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, and mm. therein mm -hmm. lies the scientific and very mm. rational approach is extremely important. Mm. And the research and the data mm. is very important as well. Yeah with which to decide what to be the best at. Because yeah. it's not just to be the best at, it's something you can leapfrog either competition or, 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 or any other state. thing. You can be the best mm -hmm. at something that truly matters yeah. to that end user, right? Mm -hmm. And so having that empathy is key instead of having a more kind of inward looking part about what your team is obsessed with or passionate about. Yeah. And that's yeah. hard to do. Yeah. Decoupling what truly matters to the user to what you, you're so yeah. fired up about. Oh, yeah. I love this feature. It's yeah. got to be what, uh, what we're going to be yeah. the best at. Yeah. And that just doesn't work. Yeah. Right? I think that it requires, actually, you know, strangely enough, it does require a, a certain level of you know, dispassionness. Dispassionness. Dispassionness? Yeah, dispassionateness. Know. Dispassionateness. Yeah. If that is a word. Yes, yeah. It, it just, it, you just kind of have to really view things uh, uh, from, you know, uh, problem or or, or, or or customer or user first mm. um, I think it's very easy to fall in love with you know your solutions and your 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 ideas or the things that you know you you particularly kind of good at or you, what you've been doing for uh, uh, for a while and I think that that part is yeah I, I agree with you that that is that is probably one of the the, the, the harder uh, uh, ones where you can actually because it's, it's hard to say that oh this thing that you know I'm really fired up about or this thing that I've been doing for a while actually doesn't really matter mm. like that's a really hard thing to say for, for, for I would say anyone yeah which is super hard being in a tech company with running like hundreds of experiments at the same time mm. by default things have to fail yeah the majority of things have to fail yeah right mm -hmm. and so if you're if you if you don't have that mental resilience to know that your baby could be irrelevant, yeah, then you know it's kind of hard being in a tech company. Yeah, yeah, where, yeah. where you have to constantly experiment. By default, that means you have to fail most of the time. Yeah, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that kind of like ties us all together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love what you said about trade offs gotta hurt for it to be meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. They have to be mm -hmm. painful for it to mean something in yeah. the organization. So if what you're saying, what you're sacrificing is not painful, mm. then I think that there's something wrong there. That you should yeah. reassess again 
what is it that you are not, uh, 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 what is it again that you, you should be sacrificing even more so? Yeah. And I yeah. think that, uh, so just to remind the three axioms, we short term gains, a lot of people talk about it, short term benefits, short term success. But the difference between short term success and long term success is that willingness and I think courage to believe that those unsexy, slower, more painful investments you put into your organizations will ultimately lead to a far longer successful run uh, and in a much more sustainable way. Yeah, and it's it, it's hard. It's it's hard in uh, it's hard in any any kind of fast paced industry, right? It's it's because. Uh, saying that oh we're going to slow down um, things it, it, it's almost against the, the philosophy of, of, of the um, industry blitz scaling yeah it's, yeah <laughs> no totally totally and, and I think that's why but it's also like you know obviously you know in the, in the grand scheme of things you know if you look at like how fast companies are executing and, and, are, and are moving we're definitely you know still in the fast range of, of of the spectrum right if you kind of look at the universe of of, of, of companies but um i i do think that you know there comes a, a point where uh, a little bit more uh, a deliberation and, and 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 thoughtfulness is is required and i think out of at least for you know all the companies that that i admire like i i've seen this be a pretty consistent theme where um you know i'm always shocked when i hear um uh, uh, the amount of effort and depth um, a lot of you know, leaders I've seen in, uh, um, in many other companies put into their people uh, put into their organization that don't have like payoffs this week or next month or it might be at best to be something like oh next quarter you know mm-hmm. this, this is going to be great um, and I'm al- always really amazed at uh, you know uh, companies that will say like okay this is one thing we're really going to nail, right? And 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 and, and kind of see that. Every, and you check in like every year, it's still the thing that they really want to nail. Like that level of conviction of saying like, oh, we're gonna be great at this. Mm. Um, and then seeing them execute it, you know, month by month, year by year, and seeing like, oh, oh. And then, uh, so I think you know, I, I mean, I can name a company. I guess in this case, which who's actually one of our investors, uh, Google. Um, you know, when they a few years ago said they wanted to be an AI first company, um, it was like, okay, that sounds cool, right? But um, I recently, I think over maybe over the past uh, year, I've recently been totally hooked on YouTube. I never used to be a mm-hmm. regular YouTube visitor. Like, usually I just saw it when like people linked me a, a, a video and I watched it and then I just bounced, right? Same exact thing. Right? I feel exactly the same. Right. I don't know why suddenly I'm, yeah. I'm so much more. The recommendations yeah. are just amazing, <laughs> right? You're just like, fuck, I've just spent yeah. like an hour and a half of my life just like in a YouTube hole. Yeah, it's like a learning <laughs> like yeah. a hub, right? Yeah. Either that or entertainment, but for either reason, it just keeps guessing what I want to do next. Yeah. Like, uh, and so you see like the, that payoff, right? Yeah, like They want to be the best at recommendations. Well, artificial Hopefully. intelligence, yeah, yeah. 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 and, and yeah. They, 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 I've read, I've read uh, multiple uh, uh, articles about how, um, you know, they've they've cracked uh, through AI the YouTube recommendation engine, and you know, as users, this is now a huge advantage. Like, if imagine trying to start another just general video sharing platform right. today, right. like it creates you, these moats, yeah, massive moats, yeah, yeah, and and I, I, yeah, I, I can't, I mean. I, Obviously, there's multiple video sharing kind of uh, 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 companies being started uh, with niches, but I, I really think that you know YouTube have such a large advantage. I think uh, uh, in the general video space, um, I, I really don't see how they could get challenged in the near term. And it's amazing that you kind of see a company publicly say that, "Oh, we're going to do this," and then suddenly, like a product just like leaps. In, right. in, in terms of just quality, uh, 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 you know, about like a year or two years after that. Right. Well, dude, I think I think we've covered a lot of ground here. Uh, we, we've run out of time, mm. but you know, we could go on for hours about. Oh, this, this is a great topic. We, yeah. we can go on for hours about this, but you know, with with all great things, I think we've come to two kind of conclusions. 
long-term success takes a lot of sacrifice in the short term, a lot of painful activities that wow. don't deliver fruits that are obvious, yeah. that are more painful than beneficial in the short run. Mm. But you need to trust the investment process because mm. it constantly compounds to the future. Yeah. And I think it's much easier for companies to ignore this fact. But if you get that right in the beginning, there's your probability of success, I think, coming in year three, four, five, and then 10 years is exponentially greater. So make those painful moves early yeah, and be successful later. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thanks a lot, Kev. All right, man. Until next time. See ya. Cool. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.